my stepdad, like he, he was the worst of it. Uh, he's one of those people that uh, every single day of my life, I would be told you're worthless. You're going to amount to nothing. You're going to be in prison. I think it was just being so disgusted with myself, being so sick and tired of feeling bad and looking bad. You know, it's, it's, it, you, you do certain things like you, you, you wear certain clothes to try to cover up and you don't want to look in the mirror and you're kind of avoiding reality. My wife and kids can be like, what's wrong? What's going on? So they can sense what's under the surface. And there is a lot of rough stuff under the surface that, that I suppress, that I avoid, I don't want to think about. Cool stuff. Good afternoon there, Brent. Buddy, I'm so excited to have you joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast, bud. Oh, thanks for having me, Gareth. Uh, uh, we've been talking for quite a bit and I've been so excited to join you at some point. Uh, so I was really happy today's here. Yeah, but it's really cool. It's funny because just before the start of this, I was like, I was messaging you at like, you know, a, a couple minutes after the we were supposed to start and I was like, but are you dialing in? Are you dialing in? <laughs> and um, yeah, and then it's like you you just, I don't know, you said you're a little bit busy, so you flipping got sidetracked. And um, but I'm so happy that we're chatting, but like it's 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 just it's I've listened to a lot of your shows. Uh, you're a very deep, well spoken guy, and I know that uh, you know, you just kind of know your stuff. So um I I wanted to really start it off though with a like just a massive congratulations, but I know that you've been on this health journey, I think, since the start of the year. Uh, December 27th. So, so yeah, it's like just before the start of the year. Good man. And, and you're down 52 pounds already, which is, which is amazing. But I mean, congratulations. I know you've got a target of dropping 100, I think, in the year. So 48 to go. And how's that all going for you? It's going really well. Uh, historically, I've, I've tried to do this uh, in the past. Uh, to, for people who don't know, I injured my knee. Uh, I have pretty bad articular cartilage damage. I've been a distance runner my whole life. Uh, did, it ran my last marathon in 2019. And that's how I kept in shape. And, and losing that uh, really, really messed with things. I have a very high pressure job. Uh, and so I just put on the weight, man. And, and, and I really struggled with uh, getting it off a few times. And, and this time it felt way different. So I think it's been a lot easier this time. Um, I, I attribute some of that to, you know, having some community on X, like that was why I set up the account in the first place. But man, it's just felt fairly easy for me. So knock on wood, let's hope it continues. But uh, so far, so good. Well, it's crazy, but that you were like this long distance runner. And then just that like one injury. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it did, did things get a little bit out of control? Do you feel like once you had that injury? Did you did you go a little bit too far, maybe? Things were out of control before, right? And so so this has been uh, a long-term thing for me. Uh, uh, people that have you know, listened to my content know that I you know, grew up with horrible child abuse. Um, and and it's, it's not an excuse, but, but it certainly is a cause uh, to some of the ways I self-sued throughout my life. I think some of those were masked by the running, being physically active, right? And then you sort of take that away and, and that, that sort of uh, you know, pathology uh, just becomes readily manifest, right? So it did, that, that was the thing holding the gates uh, of hell back and, and, and sort of I let it overtake my life. And so um, it, it really was a, a, a signal of something deeply wrong. Um, and and uh, like I said, I'm in the process of, of just trying to, to write it, right? They're trying to get that uh, sort of a beat back into submission uh, right now. It's a, it's a constant struggle though. So what like, I mean, after sort of maybe going a bit of the wrong way, like in terms of your health, what has inspired you again to get healthy like all of a sudden this year? I think it was just being so disgusted with myself, being so sick and tired of feeling bad and looking bad, you know, it's, it's, it, you, you, you do certain things like you, you you wear certain clothes to try to cover up and you don't want to look in the mirror and you're kind of avoiding reality, pouring myself into work and, and all the wrong things. Right. And so I think it just got became a repetitive, repetitive thing that popped up in my life. It was like, oh, man, you should take care of this. Oh, man, you should take care of this. And it kept nagging, kept nagging. Um, and to a point where I just I saw myself one day and I was like, and actually, that's if you look at my, my uh, Twitter account, that's the, the picture, my before picture. Um, I just went in the, the bathroom. I took my shirt off and I said, here's where I'm at. Like, hey, world, th this and I posted it. I said, that was one of my very first uh, you know, Twitter posts. I, I just like, look, this is this is where I'm at. Uh, this is the reality of the situation. And that sort of first step of a sort of acknowledging reality, not not trying to hide it, not trying to distract myself from it. Um, I think that was the, the first real step towards making meaningful change. I think it takes a lot of guts to do what you did to to post a picture, you know, when you when you're not in shape. Mm -hmm. And but at the same time, it's 
it's it's very motivating, I guess, for you to to carry on because you like you're putting it out there. They always say like when you want to achieve a goal, you should you should know you should tell people about it, and that kind of what eggs you on sort of thing. So, have you found that you've found like a decent community or people that are you know really supportive in your corner? Oh, absolutely! Like anyone who who sort of engages with me on X sees like I, I got a whole group of people around me that are in the health and nutrition space, that are in the fitness space, that are in the personal improvement space. And, and just engaging with that positive uh, feedback daily, it sort of helps keep you motivated. Uh, the times when it's a little bit tough, um, you, you think about it, it's like, well, hey, man, like I've got, uh, and it's a small audience, I'm like a couple hundred followers, but these people, uh, you know, I know and I interact with fairly often and they would, you know, miss me in, ex- in a certain extent if I wasn't posting, right? Like, it, it, and I, th- I think just having that, that sort of accountability and, and, and sort of tracking your milestones. If you look at my bio, I have how many pounds I'm down and how many I have to get, like sort of, and I use a hashtag show your work a lot, which is like, hey, just put forward whatever it is that you're doing. And I think that you're gonna get a lot of positive feedback. And also I, I do that with others as well. And I think the more that we all do that and focus on cheering each other on and trying to uplift each other, uh, I think that's kind of been the key for me. Uh, and that was something that was missing for me in the past, doing it all by myself, which is something I tend to do just doesn't work. Like we're, we're in this thing together. Uh, and in social media, uh, I've said this before, uh, it can be a toxic place, but I also think it's what you make of it. And, and the more that you engage positively with others, I think the more of that you're going to get back. And I think uh, more people could learn, uh, you know, that thing that I've learned through this process. Absolutely. But it's kind of been my experience. I think my, my whole life, like, you know, the, I guess the more positive you are, the, the better it's received by people. And People want to be around people that are positive. You know, they don't really want to be around people that are negative and complaining and moaning all the time. They, they, they kind of steer clear of you. So, you know, you, you attract, I guess, what you put out there and that's clearly what you're doing now. Yeah. A hundred percent. I can confirm. And, and by the way, I'm not saying like, uh, I've always been perfect in this. I used to be pretty toxic uh, around it, around political things or just general negativity. Uh, it's super easy. So I don't want people to get the, the idea that, oh, I just wake up every day and I'm just so happy to be alive and I jump out of bed and I'm skipping like that. That's not the case. That's not reality, man. But but uh, intentional positivity um, has a lot of utility. Uh, I think people can get really cynical about it because if you feel bad about yourself, if you are in that rut of, of being negative and sort of toxic, um, like you, you, you don't want to think about other people um, doing that as an intentional practice. You sort of, uh, I think it's, there's a dismissive aspect of it where it'd be like, oh, well, that person is just uh, a naive, right? Like it's, it's almost like, a, like, oh, that person doesn't really know how tragic the world is or how hard it is to be me or, or whatever it is. There's a narrative that goes through people's heads sometimes that justifies that, that sort of toxic you know, worldview and behavior. Um, and so I want to make sure people understand, like, it's not easy, right? Like it, positivity is, it, is there specifically because it's not easy. Life is very difficult and we're all in this together, whether we like it or not. Um, and, and so, so, so I, I, that's like my high level view of the entire topic. And, and I really wish more people would adopt that uh, point of view instead of being cynical and instead of being bitter and, and all those negative things, because it's so easy to get there, but it's just, man, it's, it's, the alternative is just much better. Absolutely. And I know that you have a goal. I think it's in 2025 to run a, a, another marathon. Uh, you are you doing any work on your on your knees at all? Like, have you heard of the knees over toes guy? Have you checked his stuff out? I haven't. I've talked to him personally, uh, and it, it's beyond his uh, scope, right? Uh, he basically said, like, look, there's this other person I want you to talk to. I haven't reached out to this person yet, but he's like, hey, you have a really tough situation. Um, I'm not sure I could help you. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to continue, uh, trying to reach that goal. Uh, you know, shout out Jordan Goldstein. He's, uh, advised me to, uh, take on rucking, right. So get putting on a heavy ruck, uh, and, and going out for walks and stuff like that. And so I'm going to continue to do that and see what happens. Uh, and, and also Lindy Louise, uh, shout out Lindy. Uh, she has suggested that I don't limit myself and, and to try to do whatever I can do. Um, and so I'm just going to keep doing that and with the goal of trying to run that marathon in 2025. I think if I drop the 100 pounds, I can probably do it, but only time will tell. Uh, but I'm, I'm at least not going to limit myself at this point. I'm going to go ahead and say, look, it's it's possible. I'm going to do the David Goggins thing and just be like, well, whatever, we're going to try to power through it. And if I, if I don't make it, that's fine, right? Or if I run it and I have to drop out, like that's fine too. Uh, I think the important part is just setting the goal and working towards that goal. That's kind of where my mind is at right now. I'm not so so focused on the outcome right now. I think trying to 
stay on track and focus on the path in front of me uh, and just see, you know, wherever it leads, it's going to be better than where I am right now. Right. So that's just where I'm at. I'm, I'm not so goal focused. I'm just like, Hey, let, let's see where we can get to. But, but, but I would love to be able to run a marathon again. Like I love doing them. They're so much fun. Um, and it would be really great just mentally to be like, Hey man, I did it. Like I actually got one across the line. What's your favorite marathon that you've done so far? That's an interesting one. Um, I would have to say the Salt Lake City Marathon. That's the one I've done the most often. And it was the very first one that I did. Um, and I really stepped in it, that first one. I ended up getting rhabdomyolysis. Uh, like I, it, was, it was very, very bad. I learned a whole bunch of things about marathoning. I also didn't train for it, by the way. Here's something, and I'm not sure what it says about me. Uh, I was so confident that I could just go up and run it that I just did. I signed up for it. I didn't train one time. I walked up and I ran the marathon. Um, and the most I'd done before is like a half. And I realized halfway through that marathon, I was like, oh, this is a different animal. Like once you get past half on the, on the backside, especially in Salt Lake, where you sort of turn a corner at the half and you're up uh, like this eight lane concrete road with no shade in the you know middle of summer, like it, it, it becomes really difficult. And so I was dehydrated. Like I said, I got rhabdo, uh, I had all, I was bleeding down my sides because I had like this stitch that was weird on my singlet. And like it, it, I finished that and was like, oh, I got my ass kicked. And I learned a bunch of uh, difficult lessons. Uh, but then I went back the following year. I trained for it. I corrected all the errors and I had a really good time. So, so I think the Salt Lake one is, is, is kind of special to me. Um, I got ran it like three times, but uh, each time I got better, I set a PR. Um, I really enjoy it. Uh, I think it's a beautiful city. I used to live there for a while. It's a, it's a gorgeous city, gorgeous run. The first half of it's downhill and sort of cool and, and nice. Um, the second half is an ass kicker. So, so all in all, like that's probably my favorite one. Um, yeah, I think that I'm going to stick with that. I really enjoy that, that course. That's cool. And, and just out your injury, was it like, was it like a big accident or was it something that's just like a stupid thing that happened. It was a stupid thing. It was just a, a knee twist on flat surface, just like nothing going on. But it, it basically my knee did a 90 degree twist. And so my femur head uh, smacked into the back of my kneecap and it knocked off two pieces of articular cartilage. So I have flaps on the back of my kneecap and the front of my femur head. And they they click as I'm as I'm trying to, you know, run, walk, whatever. They they pop and uh, it swells up like it's full of fluid. Like it's it's really bad. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a tough one and, and they can't do surgery on it really. I mean, I can have a partial knee replacement, but I'm trying to be conservative about it. Uh, I don't want to go under the knife. There might be some things that come down the road with PRP or there's going to be some uh, stem cell treatment or something that I might be able to, um, you know, get, but I can't reverse the knee surgery, right? Like if you do a knee replacement, even a partial that's kind of a permanent thing. And so I'm trying to be conservative about it. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I might go that route, but I'm at least going to lose a hundred pounds and, and try to run and see if I can make it work. If not, I can always have the surgery. It's so, it's so crazy how it's like often just something small, which you know, it leads to these long-term injuries. Um, yeah, but so you've written a, a tweet, uh, which sort of allows us to sort of enter into a bit of your story here. And you said, I have a few hot button issues. Child abuse and religious cults are at the top of the list. Few things get my blood boiling quite like those. The tweet actually carries on, but I listened to you speaking uh, with George, uh, the, the Tin Men, and mm -hmm. uh, you really sort of dived into some of your story there. And I mean, you had a rough and difficult childhood to say the least. Uh, so, some of that story, uh, which I recall, is like you, you have a long history of trauma. You were brought up by a single mother. Um, your first sexual experience was at age eight, and that's because you were raped by a babysitter. Uh, your mom remarried when you were eight, and your stepdad was very physically and verbally abusive. I mean, that just sounds like, like hell, to be totally honest with you. Um, is it possible just to talk about that a little bit at all? I have no problem talking about it. Um, that, you know, my childhood was, and, and you also didn't talk about the religious trauma too. So you know, overlay on top of that, uh, being raised by a very old school Catholic mom, grandma, like uh, I mentioned in other episodes, like I have my mom's cousin is a Jesuit uh, in the Vatican. Uh, my my grandfather's brother was the bishop of the state of South Dakota for like 28 years, right? So like deep, deeply punitive Catholic type of, uh, you know, upbringing, went to a, a religious school. Um, 
uh, and also raised in poverty too, which by American standards, uh, I have to cl clarify that uh, by world standards, I was doing well, but by American standards, I was, I was very poor. Um, and so all of it uh, combined just made childhood very difficult uh, and caused a lot of lasting damage, uh, particularly with my stepdad. Like he, he was the worst of it. Uh, he's one of those people that uh, every single day of my life, I would be told you're worthless. You're going to amount to nothing. You're going to be in prison. You're going to be digging ditch. You know, it's just that type of stuff like all the time. He was very explosive temper, uh, would, you know, grab you by the neck and lift you off the ground, smash you into the wall. And, and it, like that was like a daily uh, type of thing. Um, and so it was, it was very traumatic and it was very, uh, damaging. Right. And so I'm still to this day, I'm almost 50. I'll be 50 next year. Uh, still going through trying to unwind some of that damage. Uh, I did go to therapy, uh, when I was living up in Seattle, I had a great, great therapist who the PhD at the university of Washington, uh, deals with trauma and addiction and a bunch of other things. And he told me essentially like, look, you can't unravel a lot of this stuff. Um, he's like, you know, the, the solution, you know, to, to damage caused by child abuse is to not, not abuse a child, right? Like, uh, he likened it to being in a car crash or, you know, like a horrible car accident where you get mangled when you're five years old. Um, he's like expecting an adult to walk without a limp after that. It, it's impossible. He's like, you know, there's just lasting damage. It's like, you, you can work on it. You can certainly improve some things, but, but, uh, I think he level set me a little bit as far as, uh, you know, expectations, because I always struggled with seeing other people uh, that were maybe uh, coming from a, a better family, uh, non-abusive background, a little bit well adjusted. And I would look at them uh, and, and be like, man, I really want to get there. Like I want to, you know, I would sort of strive for some sort of normalcy. Um, and I think going to therapy helped me get comfortable with the fact that there's not going to be normalcy for me, right? I, I can, there's a better and a worse, and I can continue to improve and get better each day, which I'm working on. Uh, but ultimately, there, there's been damage, and that's just uh, that's just a fact. And, and trying to not project that forward onto my kids has really been my focus. Like that, that's where my you know, like not not for my selfish purposes. So like, hey, I I want to feel better uh, about myself and, and and try to feel healthier, more mentally well adjusted. It's like, how do I not uh, perpetuate the cycle, and how do I interrupt this so it doesn't get passed down to the next generation? That's really where my my mind has been probably my whole life, even before I was really self aware of a lot of the trauma. It was just a like, man, I don't want to mess up my kids. For sure. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Gabor Mate at all? Yes. In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts is a fabulous book. I, I love Gabor's work. He's a fascinating guy, isn't he? And like, he's, there's something so special about him as well. And, and, but you can, you can see in his eyes, like, you know, it, it's almost like he still himself carries the trauma that he experienced as a youngster. He has these kind of like sad eyes, I feel. Um, and, and I think it, what, what your uh, therapist said is kind of in line with a, a lot of what he says too, you know, like you can, you can try and understand what happened and you can have tools and, and all these things, but you're not necessarily going to get kind of rid of that trauma. You can just manage it and, and maybe try lessen it or whatever, but it's, it's there. It's like kind of part of your existence. You have to, you have to learn in a way to live with it. And then, like you said, the best thing to do is not to, not to pass that on and to, to give your kids a completely different life and this sort of sense of just joy, I guess. Easier said than done. Uh, one of the interesting things, if you are up on some of the, the literature around trauma is epigenetic changes. Uh, are you familiar with epigenetics? I've had, um, Dr. Bruce Lipton on the podcast. So yeah, I know it very well. Cool. So folks who may not understand epigenetics is that we basically have a genome, that's our DNA, and then there's something called gene expression. So by the process of methylation, you can actually activate genes, turn them on and off like switches. Um, and uh, I think one of the most famous uh, experiments that have been done or areas of research has been around uh, Jewish Holocaust uh, survivors and their families, right? And so you can see the epigenetic changes uh, passed down to multiple generations. Uh, and so even if you do all the right things, uh, quote unquote, I mean, you can't do all the right things. But let's say you do all the major things correctly uh, with respect to raising your children. Um, oftentimes those epigenetic imprints are things you can't take away. They, they just happen. Like they're, they're an evolved mechanism. They're there because they're trying to protect you from the environment. There, there are signals that say you're not in a safe environment. There might be war, there might be famine. There, this, it's, a, it's an evolved mechanism. And so you can't switch that off as much as you would like to um, you know, create a, a safer and more comfortable and healthier uh, environment for your kids. Like those switches get turned on. They're like, hey, we're, we're, we're not in a safe space. 
Um, and so I think that's something that's that's really important for people to know. And that's why that quote that you referenced, where I said it's a hot button issue for me, is because I have done a lot of research and I understand personally my own life as well as from what the literature tells us that of how damaging this is uh, for not just the individuals that are abused, but for for uh, their descendants and, and people around them, their their families, their friends. Um, it, it's so absolutely horrific uh, that I just want to put a stop to it. That's, that's like uh, probably my hottest button issue is, is violence towards children and abuse of children. It's obviously impossible to know like what's going on in, in somebody's head. Uh, you, you seem to be like quite a happy and, you know, like confident guy. Do you have any nightmares or anything about this at all? Or have you just managed to sort of move on and compartmentalize it at all compartmentalize is probably a, a better term and uh and and i get that a lot i hear people say that oh you're this happy-go-lucky guy and you seem pretty positive and cheerful which i am right um but that is masking a lot of stuff under the surface right uh it, it, one of the interesting things about being married to somebody who is highly sensitive um, and also my daughters are as well, is that they can actually sense the energy uh, that, that I'm putting off. So if, if I like Gareth might say, man, Brent was fine when I talked to him today. My wife and kids can be like, what's wrong? What's going on? So they can sense what's under the surface. And there is a lot of rough stuff under the surface that, that I suppress, that I avoid. I don't want to think about. And I would jokingly refer to it as the cancer box, like, like so just stuff it down, stomp on it. And like, well, let's pretend we're, we're not, uh, you know paying attention to that well let's just focus on trying to be surface happy right and that, that's a lot of the, the sort of programming that that I've, I've had and i think a lot of it's been a defense mechanism uh because you know growing up like i would get this abuse at home and then i'd have to go to school and be okay right and you're embarrassed too like you don't want to you know advertise the world you have a terrible home life and things are awful for you you try to make the best of it and also you don't want to think about it when you're away from it if that makes sense like, like when I left the home, I was like, I would go to school and it's like, oh, those people are gone now. And now I can try to focus on this over here. And so it was almost a schism in the brain. Like it just it completely uh, bifurcated my mind. And I don't like to go rummaging around in there and, and thinking about things, frankly, because it is really dark. It's really, really terrible and it's awful. And I don't like to think about it. And, and I'm sure that that's probably not super healthy, uh, but it's what I've done to survive up to this point. I think our brains are extremely smart and extremely protective they they do things like that they actually block stuff out uh, I, when i was 16 i had like a crazy motorbike accident and was basically luckily to lucky to be alive but i remember nothing okay i mean i only remember like a, a few instances in hospital afterwards and i totally think that that is my brain uh working in my favor and protecting me because there's no ways you want to remember that moment just before impact traveling at like 80 kilometers an hour when you 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 went head on into a car you know and i think that's one thing we almost need to be thankful for for our brain that it is so switched on um yeah and and it's it's helping you in, in many ways by not you know by just putting those things at the back of your mind yeah i agree to a certain extent um uh one of the things if you're from the brain uh biology or neuroscience is that that's the member the part of your brain that transfers your exp experiential data into long-term storage is the hipp hippocampus and that's one of the things that's damaged by child abuse if you actually do a brain scan of somebody who suffered abuse as a kid you're going to see hippocampal damage you're going to see the amygdala which is the fight or flight center of the brain fight flight or freeze actually that's going to be like oversized it's going to be massive because it's highly attuned to threat um, prefrontal cortex will be shrunken. Um, uh, but, but long story short, I would go back to the hippocampus. Um, yes, it protects you against those painful memories in the short term. Um, but also, I think that amnesia, it doesn't do us favors in the long term sometimes, right? Because if you look at you know, Gabor Matei's work or others, you know, it's like the body keeps the score, right? Like it, it, it's, it's still in there and it's still embodied in you, whether you're conscious of it or not. And sometimes I think that amnesia, even though it protects you in the short term, I think long term, it may, especially if it's a chronic trauma, I think it may actually, uh, you know, work against you uh, towards resolving some of that trauma, if that makes sense. It makes 100% sense, you know, like, and I guess it, it sort of can manifest itself in, in different parts of your body, uh, you know, that you don't even realize, like, like, I'm just thinking now, like, hearing you say that I'm like, I've always had like a sore lower back. Okay, and like, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a result of, say, my accident, or 
maybe that is just where this sort of uh, amnesia that's been stored, you know, is, is, is it's storing that pain there sort of thing. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the body definitely keeps score and yeah. So like, is it actually working in your favor or not? To, is, is a good question to, to ask. Yeah. And it's important to keep in mind the evolutionary context that we're talking about here. What you have to think about what your genes care about. Your genes care about reproducing, making copies, and that's it. Uh, people don't realize that your, your genes don't care about your happiness, your satisfaction, your fulfillment, your relationships. They, they don't, they only care in so much as it fosters you, uh, you know, making copies, uh, you know, reproducing. So, it's it's biology is a weird thing man. like uh i think a lot of people don't think deeply about it and by not doing that uh they're missing important pieces of, of data um and and so it's all i always try to remind myself almost daily like look you're just a you know, you're your copy machine like uh, your, your genes want to make copies and they don't care about you know how healthy you are what the quality of your life is just make copies like it's it's a painful lesson but i think it's important uh, to contextualize what we're going through talking about copies you this is this is like sort of following on a little bit uh, as you said you were you were brought up in a very religious um household i know that you went to military uh quite soon after you finished school um you also married very young and it sounds like your your wife at the time was bipolar and violent and had a personality disorder and that sounded pretty pretty hectic um there was instance I, I think you left her i don't know how how early on but you you know you had to sort of like go sleep in your car uh, sleep at the office these sort of things to in many ways remain safe um and you as a man you you sort of obviously felt ashamed just to even admit that you know that uh, these sort of things were happening to you um, which is, yeah, like people, if you did say something, someone would go, oh yeah, what are you talking about, Brent? Like you're a bloke, you know, like, you know, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, yeah. I, I totally, I've actually had a guy on the podcast who was a huge military guy in the Australian army, been to all the wars. He was abused by his wife and they would not take him seriously one little bit. They were like, look at you, but look, I mean, seriously, like you, there's no ways there's issues here. And, and he, it was for years and years and years and no one would ever listen to him. And then eventually they did. Uh, one of the parts of the story, which for me is like absolutely heartbreaking is I think you have a couple of kids uh, with your ex-wife and you've, you've never been allowed to see them. And that's just, that must, I mean, sorry, I know this is kind of like a bit deep and maybe sad, uh, but it's just, that breaks my heart because I have a daughter now. I mean, I know you have other kids now, but that, that must be a, a deep scar. Yeah, it really is. It's one that I don't like to think about a whole lot. I think my wife, my current wife, uh, she does a lot more than I do because she knows how much it hurts me and how much I don't want to think about it. And so she's, uh, man, talk about a hot, hot button topic for her. That's, that's my, my ex-wife. Um, it was really hard because uh, my my ex wife had just been sentenced on a felony charge. You know, she almost beat an elderly couple to death, um, and uh, my uh, oldest daughter Mackenzie she testified in court against her mom, basically saying that like you know living with her was was hell and it was abusive and awful and that sort of thing. And, and that I broke down crying in the middle of the sentencing. Um, I was watching by Zoom, but the, that that was really hard to watch because uh, as a father, like your job is to protect your kids, right? And to not have access to them because of the court system, not be able to help and then all, then have to sit and hear, you know, the, the details of, of what they went through is just like that. That was that was really, really tough. And that was within the last few months. So this is this is still pretty recent wound. Do you have like a a hate relationship with the system for what they do to fathers and a lot of the instances 100 percent. it's ghastly like uh particularly i only, only have the you know, experience of the washington state court system but up there it is uh it's absolutely repugnant uh the way they operate it, it is it is just awful no but sorry yeah sorry sorry to speak about that um moving on men uh you like you, you've obviously just grown i feel so much as a person um since maybe you went to the military, I, I don't know. I don't know when you sort of like uh, truly made an escape and started, uh, you know, becoming the man that you are now. But I, what, you got a really cool story um, that you that you tweeted about, uh, and 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 I love these. I really love these. And you, you, it, this one is like, this is my old boss, Adrian. 
He gave me my first big break into big tech at Oracle in 2008. If it wasn't for him, I would never have learned to code and I never would have gotten the job I have now and have had for the last 11 years. I'll be eternally grateful for his willingness to take a chance on me and his patience in developing me as an engineer. My life and the lives of my team would look vastly different without Adrian. Tell me a bit about Adrian, bud. Oh man, I, I love Adrian. Uh, yeah, so it was a really interesting uh, whole series of events. So I was a serial entrepreneur before this. So I was in the tech space uh, in a different field. I was in telecommunications. And, and then I ended up uh, during the dot-com crash, uh, finding a little niche buying, uh, you know, there's a bunch of companies went bankrupt. And so I would work with property management companies to buy out these data centers and resell their assets. And I did very well doing that. Uh, but at a certain point, like you're traveling 300 days a year, you have young kids, like it, it didn't really work out. So, so I exited that. My wife, my current wife continued to like encourage me, like, yeah, maybe you get a real job is essentially what the message was, you know, like, like stop the entrepreneur thing. Um, and so like, fine, I'll, I'll look into it. And I took a, co a job with a company called Varian that did uh, medical stuff. They would make like CT machines and a bunch of medical uh, technology equipment. Um, and I hated it. Like I had to wear khakis and a button up shirt to work every day. And it was just like the soul was being sucked out of me. And I just started that job. And then the, the Oracle offer came in, um, which by the way, the interview was insane because, uh, Adrian is from Romania and I was taking the phone call, uh, during my interview and I couldn't see his lips. There was no video conferencing back then. It was on the phone. It was like a, a group call with like 10, 10 engineers. And he kept you know, saying things to me and I kept saying, what? And I just, I, I, I couldn't stop my, then I finally had to tell myself, I had that like Samuel L. Jackson thing from Pulp Fiction. It's like, say what again, motherfucker. Like I had such a hard time not saying what. I couldn't understand him at all. And I finished the interview convinced that I had bombed the thing and I wasn't going to get the job. And uh, Adrian is the one who sort of like convinced everybody to, to take a chance on me. So I kind of found out after the fact that, you know, the whole story behind it. And so like, yeah, definitely grateful for him. But my, my wife at the time didn't want me to take the Oracle job. Like it got offered to me and I knew, I knew, I knew it was a great opportunity. Um, and she's like, you just took this job. They just sent you to all this training. Um, you know, bailing now is not a good idea. And it just so happened that she was sick uh when when the, the offer with the money attached to it came and everything and she just looked at me she's like i don't i'm too sick to fight just do whatever you want and, and i did and, and like i said it completely changed my life that was that was uh somebody like me who's got a degree in nothing like took me 13 years to graduate high school um that was a big deal right and, and i really had some doors opened up and i never forgot that uh that, that was really special to me he's a special person to me uh, i was really cool to see him again after all this time i love how in like a lot of people's lives, there's almost that one person who like says, okay, cool. I can see something in you mm -hmm. and I'm going to give you a chance. And, uh, that like, that, that just has this massive trajectory and just change for everything and, and everyone like you, I always say to the guys that I like that I work with and stuff, I'm like, never underestimate the impact that you can have on somebody, you know, just through maybe, I don't know, saying something nice to them or accepting them or giving them a chance or an opportunity because you, you, you never know the ripple effect of that. It could be massive. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I've been very intentional as I've gone through my life to try to extend those opportunities to other people and sort of pay it forward. One example is uh, my, my brother-in-law, John, he was, he had a construction company for like a lot of years. Like he, he built uh, residential homes in Utah. Um, and the 2008 financial crisis happened and uh, he was really struggling. Like he was going to lose his business and he didn't know what he was going to do to pay his bills. And uh, I reached out to him and I said, hey, man, like going back to the old dot com stuff, like I know a business that we can spin up. I know exactly how to do this. And he's like, cool, let's do it. And so I, we did it. We started that business again, doing asset recovery. And during that time, I taught him tech. He would sort of be on the calls with me in his truck um with adrian leading the call like so he had to by osmosis listen to what we were doing and he would ask questions and i'd teach him various aspects of it um and through that uh you know after we you know i went to 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 work at the company i went i work at now uh, which i'm not going to disclose uh and he went to work at goldman sachs and eventually worked his way up to become the vp of the the voice division uh in salt lake city for goldman um, and now he's working with me on my team. Now we both moved to Nashville together. And so that sort of came full circle. 
uh, two other folks uh, I brought on. One was a paramedic uh, and, and somebody that I found on Twitter that has had been coding on his own, just learning how to code and sort of brought him on a contract and he killed it, converted him to a permanent. And the other guy, uh, Brian uh, from the band Have Mercy, uh, he he was just looking for a job. I uh, saw so him on Instagram, had no tech experience at all. And I was like, hey, I got a contract role. Like, let's see if you can hang. And, and he did. He came in, absolutely crushed it. Um, and both those two guys are, are doing fantastic. Are moving into you know multiple six figure type of uh, you know situations. Uh, so 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 I'm I'm very much aligned with that view. Like like give somebody a chance. Um, you know, put your neck out for somebody. Try to bring them up. Uh, I think that's really really important. Yeah, paid forward is is a huge thing. But it, it it reminds me. I I used to work for an investment bank, and I used to uh, also like hire a lot of blokes and and girls and stuff like that, and. I would always choose the person that was like the, I don't know, the keenest or, or had the, the best energy about them. And um, I could just see, I was like, okay, cool. Maybe they're not the the best qualified or have the, the most amount of experience, but this person is going to flip and push over walls for you sort of thing. And it was always those people who just went on to be absolute superstars and also generally become your friends too, because they knew that you were kind of giving them a chance. You know, they were like, mm, I can, I can kind of feel, I don't have the experience for this, um, but he's taken me on. So uh, let me give it my all, be a good person. And, and yeah, ultimately like I'm still in touch with these people, you know, they're all scattered around the world. And it's just like, yeah, I remember that when we were both like youngsters and, and now look at us, you know, all fathers or mothers and stuff. And it's a, uh, it's cool, man. I think, I think the work environment, like sometimes it gets a lot of, um, yeah, like these days, you know, like people are like, yeah, oh, you got to be an entrepreneur and this and that. But, you know, I look back at my, my career and I'm like, I got so many great friends and so many great memories. Like the workplace is what you make of it for sure. And you can make it an awesome place if you do things right. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think there's certainly value in finding people, like you said, that you, you, you they know that they're out of their element. They're, they're a little bit over their head and they have to work really hard as long as you identify them properly. There, there's a certain aspect that we look for in our team, which is just grit. Like, I want to have a, I want to hear your story. I want to see what you've overcome uh, because you can't replace grit. There's a lot of these kids I see all, I interview tons of people and they're coming out of college and they've never had anything difficult. They've been sheltered at home and they've been, you know, patted on the butt all the way through. And maybe they've got the degree in computer science. But I've seen these people come through because I hired a bunch of contractors and a lot of these folks with degrees, sometimes advanced degrees, couldn't do shit. They, they couldn't perform at, at all. Like I, these guys that had no experience were running rings around them. Uh, and, and so I think there is, if you, if, you, if you give an opportunity to somebody that has grit, that appreciates it, like you said, that forges a bond. Um, and, and I think it, it sort of breeds this sort of uh, unity within within team. Like I said, it's almost like a family type of dynamic. Like that's why I feel on my team. It's like it's almost like a quasi extended family. Um, and, and, and I think you there's something special to that dynamic that people that would strictly go by the book and be like, oh, I'm going to look at the resume, make sure they check all the boxes and they look good on paper. I think they're missing the, for, the forest for the trees sometimes. Absolutely, but I mean, yeah, I used to I used to have sort of these challenges with the guys that I would like that were on my team that were also interviewing the people and it, I would always go for a different person because they would be straight by the book you know and they'll be like yeah well you know this this guy's got the experience and you know this and that and I'll be like yeah but didn't you get this feeling about this person you know <laughs> and I think I think that's such an important part of of, of hiring people and and uh, yeah, but it gets, it doesn't always get, get considered. That's for sure. So I'm glad, I'm glad you're that type of bloke. Um, another cool thing, which uh, I really enjoyed reading about uh, what, what you wrote was you said, one of the things I'm most proud of in my life, my wife and I agreed from the start that she would stay home and manage the home and take care of our kids. And I would be the sole provider. She never contributed a single penny to the finances in 23 plus years. Now, some people are going to hear this and they're going to go flipping crazy, right? <laughs> and that's just, a, of course. that's just a sign of the times, you know what I mean? But I think that's so beautiful. One, like, I don't think many people maybe even talk about this as couples, you know, because I don't know, people don't have tough conversations these days. It seems like they, they'd rather just like 
some massive fight manifest because they're too scared to have the difficult conversation um, and put their thoughts across. Uh, so, so that's like huge. And, you know, you did that 23 years ago. Uh, but like, how, how have you found that, you know, like, um, you know, how does it get sort of uh, reciprocate, not reciprocated, how does it get like taken by people? And, um, but how does it work for you guys mostly? So a couple of things. First of all, I'm not saying you have to do it like me, right? So for all the people that are going to freak out about this, like, I don't care, for example, I'm not like super traditional, like I kind of am, but traditional in the sense that somebody should stay home, right? Like when you look at kids, it, I, I was often likened it to uh, childcare with dating, right? Let's say, for example, uh, you're, you're, you're married, Gareth, like you, you and your wife are going to go out for your anniversary. Um, and uh, you just uh, tell your wife at the last minute, hey, man, something's come up. I'm, I'm busy. Um, I've got this uh, stand in though. Steve's going to go with you uh, out for our anniversary, right? Like it's not the same thing. And that's what I think childcare is, right? And sorry, no offense, people, but like another person that you're paying to care for your children, particularly like some kinder care or some, you know, minimum wage person that's, you know, barely taking care of your kid and has 30 others to watch. They are not going to care for your child the same way you are. It's just a fact, right? And I think there's nothing wrong with saying that. Um, just It's just a fact. And so somebody should stay home, in my opinion. Like, you can do whatever you want. Um, but for us, it worked out very well. I think that having that sort of a clear uh, line, the uh, separating the roles, right? Like, th this is your lane. This is my lane. And I provide everything here. And then you take care of the kids. You know, and obviously, you cross over. Like, I cook dinners a lot. And I take care of my kids. And I've gone to all of the school functions. and. I do care as well, but but ultimately having sort of some guardrails around what your general uh, you know lines of demarcation around responsibilities are it makes it easier. I think folks now that uh, particularly nowadays where it's so prevalent that it's just oh we're just expected to be a two income household we're we're expected to put our kids in daycare. I think it becomes a lot messier to suss that out. I think you're you're opening yourself up to a lot more opportunities for arguments. So like, well, how are you going to keep track? Well, who did the laundry this week and who did the meals this week and who did the shopping that like. It, I think it becomes very difficult to segment. I'm not saying it can't be done, um, but that's just my view. On it. I think that raising children is so important and nobody other than the parents. And, you know, maybe if you're going to leave it with an extended family and aunt or grandma or whatever, um, like, like that's that's a different type of environment for a child. Uh, there's tons of negative consequences around just having kids in daycare. That's that's that literature is pretty well established. Um, not to mention the risks around, you know, child sexual abuse or physical abuse or neglect. Or there's a ton of different things that could go sideways when you're paying some minimum wage, uh, you know, group of folks to, to watch your kids. So that's just kind of like my high level mental model of it. I think the world has changed a lot over the years. Like I look back at, at my childhood. I know that I went to a creche, uh, you know, when my mom was working. It, it was like she, she was a nurse and it was basically um, a creche at the hospital um, I also went to school and I flip and loved school. Um, I spent so much time at it, you know what I mean? But it feels like the world has changed, you know, since I went to school at least, you know, I finished about 20, 20 or so years ago, 25 years ago, something like that. And um, now I definitely, I don't know, I don't feel like I, I trust the system enough. And what you said was also really interesting, which I think about a lot is like, you know, you like, I don't, I don't actually think people ask themselves this question deeply enough or, or they don't, they definitely don't ask themselves a the question. They definitely don't think about it. Like why have kids, like why are you having a kid so that after like a few months, you know, maybe you got a few months maternity leave if you're lucky, you then, you then go and send them to, to like a, a daycare or a creche. And then, you know, that just becomes school and then university. Like, you probably get to spend hardly any time with them ever. Like, so why are you having kids? Are you just having kids to then go to work, to afford, to be able to pay them, to um, go to, you know, to, to be able to afford to pay somebody else to, to grow up your kids. And, and when you think of it like that and you're like, oh, wait, I didn't think of it like that. You know, to me, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what effectively what most of the population is doing. It is kind of crazy. And you know what's even worse, Gareth? 85% uh, of the time that you will spend with your children happens age 18 and below. Yeah. So, so now the time that you're not spending with your kids, right? Like that's 85% of the time you're ever going to spend with your kids. Like that, that's wild. Yeah, it's totally wild. But, and, and I mean, 
you know, when you're sending them to school and everything like that, I mean, that 85% is not even a lot of time, you know. You might maybe getting a, a couple of hours with them in the evening if you're lucky. Maybe you're seeing them in the morning before they go to school. Like, that's not a lot of time for like the sort of, for what you're actually doing, you know. Like, you, you, you're growing up a human, you know. This is not like a joke <laughs> or, or a contract, you know. This is actually... This is actually something that's beautiful and can be sort of very deep and nourishing uh, if you really think about it that way. Yeah, I, I agree. And this goes back to my previous point about uh, evolution only caring about you making copies. It doesn't necessarily care what you do with them. It doesn't care if you've got a fulfilling relationship with your children or a dysfunctional. It doesn't, it doesn't care, right? Just make copies, right? And so I think to your point, a lot of people are not thinking about this. A lot of people are on autopilot. They're just running the programs. They're just kind of rolling through life and not really examining things. And that's sad that I think that they, we could, I think we're made for more. I think we can be more. Why do you think people are like that? I think it's just evolution, man. Like it's, it's that's the goal. Like, you know, genes are there to make another copy. That's all they care about. If you want to talk about uh, reproduction strategies, are you familiar with R versus K sexual selection? No. Yeah. So let's uh, talk about epigenetics. Every human being has got two types of reproductive strategies encoded for. You have an R and you have a K. And you're like, they've, they've done studies on this. They know exactly where the genes are located and how to switch them on and off. Um, the R, you can think of it like rabbits, right? So rabbits are a species that just reproduces as quickly as many copies as possible and then hope that some of those copies make it onto the next generation and aren't pre you know, uh, preyed on by hawks and whatever else get rabbits, right? So it's like a, a quantity strategy, whereas K is the opposite. Like wolves, for example, are a K reproductive strategy. So it's a low number of offspring, high parental investment in each offspring, right? Um, and so, so both of those things exist. And I think a lot of folks, this is why you see uh, a lot of people that are trauma survivors end up with that R strategy because evolution has sort of embedded this program. That's like, you're not in a safe space. You're off, you're in danger and your offspring are probably in danger. So let's crank out a whole bunch of them. That's why you'll see the, the trope of like the, the abused, uh, a girl with daddy issues becomes a stripper or an escort and then like, are sexually promiscuous. And there's like, man, crank out as many copies as you can, whereas somebody who comes from uh, a little bit uh, less chaotic background, has a normal, healthy, stable family life might be, have that uh, K strategy and code is like, nope, let me have one or two kids. Let's put a bunch of investment in them. Let's make sure they're cared for. It's just different reproductive strategies. And, and depending on which one you have expressed in your genes, which comes from your parents, by the way, it's not you, um, that's going to dictate your behavior to some extent. I mean, it can, it can uh, be dictated by your environment, right? Like you can be in a horrible situation and have that sort of switched on, but, but that stuff, these epigenetic switches, they actually persist uh, across generations. It's very interesting. I mean, I feel just through the way I've maybe been as a father that I'm, I'm a K for sure. And it's, it's interesting. Um, I, oh man, what was I going to, what was I going to say? Oh, I know. I, like I have intentionally sort of put my earnings, should we say, like on the back burner, right? Which which also means like, you know, I'm not sort of as hugely focused on my career as I possibly could. And that was an in intentional decision because I knew that I wanted to be a present father, right? Seven Seven years ago, I actually left my job as an investment banker. And one of the primary reasons was that I knew that at some point my wife and I were going to have kids and that I wanted to have full autonomy over my time. And I also wanted to spend as much time as possible as I could being a dad. And I know that means there's sacrifices, you know, and that, and that one sacrifice is, okay, cool. Maybe you're not going to earn as much as you possibly could, or you might not get whatever flipping promotions and all these sort of things. But for me, that, that wasn't important. You know, the important thing was, is that cool. I'm, I'm now entering this new phase of my life. This is a special moment that I'm going to treasure as much as possible. And, and that, that was my, the deci my decision making around it. Right. And I, and it just goes back to where I, I think people don't think about kids like deeply enough. Like, why are you doing it? Mm. Um, yeah. and they're also, they're not prepared to, to take sacrifices or maybe they just feel that they can't, or they, they're not, 
they're not able to afford it. I don't know. Yeah, or, or in my case, I think a, a lot of it had to do with my personal issues. Uh, like I said, I don't think I was a worst dad ever or anything like that. But I focused a lot on material stuff. And I think we talked about this. Like I was a sole provider. It was really important. You know, it's not just like a paycheck, but you know, being able to pay for medical care and braces and all the things that your kids need, which are endless. Like that's important. I think I focused on it too much because I was raised poor. And I remember what it was like as a kid growing up, not having what I needed, not having materials needs met. So I, I sort of over indexed on that. It's like, man, I'm not going to be like that. I want to make sure my kids are, are not suffering the way I was. And and I, I made some sacrifices. You know, I was, I was traveled for work uh, quite a bit. Um, I, I, I wasn't always there. Um, and I focused on how do I end up getting more and more and more. And, and I don't know exactly all the reasons behind it, but I, looking back, I think I could have dialed it back a, a fair bit. And I think I could have been more present. I see your, your posts, like the, 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 the stuff you have with your daughter on the beach. And so I always look at that. I'm like, man, that's awesome. Having, you know, not really having a dad growing up. I was like, man, I wish my dad was like that. And I was like, man, I wish I was like that more with my kids. And so like your content's like really inspirational for me. Like I, I see that and I'm like, man, you're doing a really good thing. And I wish I would have maybe dialed back you know, the material success component and, and sort of index more on that type of thing. I really appreciate it. But, um, yeah, and it's but it's also it's difficult, you know, like with what you're saying there, like you, like like now it sounds like you know you, maybe you feel a little bit of guilt, but but in the moment, like that wasn't the situation. In the moment, you're like, I'm Brent, I'm here, I'm supporting my family, and I'm going to do the best I, I totally can, you know. So hindsight is great, but I guess in the moments, like that really wasn't your intention. You were like, I'm being a great father because I'm providing for my family, um, so. It's a tough one, but because you can be hard on yourself sometimes, like now, I guess. Well, yeah, and it's not just that, Gareth. That was a pretty charitable interpretation of it. There's some other pathologies that were underlying that too. If you go back to my comments about my stepdad being told every day of your life you're worthless, you're never going to amount to anything, you're, you know, like that stuff gets down deep. And I think there was a large portion of my life where I spent trying to prove him wrong. Even though I didn't, how do we talk to him? He's out of, my, he's been out of my life forever. But there's something in that that little kid in me that's like, you know, fuck you. Like, no, I, if I make this much, and, and at this point, like I've been in tech a long time, I've made millions and millions of dollars. And still to this day, like there's that nagging thing, like, well, it's not enough. Like, you, you know, you're, you're still worthless. And so I think that sort of uh, embodied feeling of worthlessness drove me to a certain point. And I feel really bad about that. So I don't think it was all, yeah, I mean, you can always like put a, a positive spin, like, oh, I was just providing for my family. And which is true. But, but if I'm being honest, like, I think a lot of that, uh, you know, pathology that got inside me as a kid drove some of that. The cool thing is, but is that you're human, you know, and that was just your, the way that you knew to sort of respond. And we're all flawed in so many ways. I'm not saying that's a flaw at all, but like no one is perfect in any way whatsoever. Um, we're just trying to do, do the best we can. And sometimes we are trying to prove people wrong because of the way we got treated. And, and that's totally okay. You know, it's, it's just this, like, it's this, that's a fire inside of you to say, you know what, stuff you, I'm going to prove you wrong. And I don't think that's a bad thing either, but, um, you know, so, so yeah, I was wondering what's your, what's your greatest memory of fatherhood? That's a tough one. You know, I've had uh, the, the pleasure of raising three daughters in my home. My oldest <clears throat> is about to be 23 and my youngest is 17. So I've gone through a lot with them. Um, and, and I don't think there's a single greatest moment. Uh, there, there's, there's these discrete moments that, that come up. Um, It's, it's the times that we had a shared experience, I think, is the, is the thing. And it doesn't have to be like a particular one. Um, it, there's a couple that come to mind. Like uh, we lived in Seattle. Um, one of our vendors was, uh, you know, Lumen, which is now CenturyLink. Uh, if you're familiar with American football, CenturyLink Field is where the Seahawks play. And we used to get like, you know, uh, taken to the suite, right? Like on the 50 yard line next to the owner, like that, and taking my kids to something like that. And they got to put on the Super Bowl ring, the Seahawks uh, won, like um, having those, those moments or, uh, you know, I travel internationally for work a ton. I think you and I've talked about this. I've been trying to get down to down your way to, to meet in person, but, but I get to take my kids on these trips. So I've gone to Japan with them. I've gone to the UK and Ireland, like Amsterdam, like having those experiences with them and sharing something really cool with your kids. Like for me, like that is, that is really awesome. 
Um, uh, I know it's probably have, it has to do somewhat with my, my attachment issues. I know you're, you're very well versed in attachment stuff. You had Adam Lane Smith on recently. I'm an avoidant all day long and my brain works on dopamine, right? So for me, that's the thing that's going to come up is like the big, wow, you know, the, uh, my wife sometimes refers to it as Disney Disneyland dad syndrome. I'm trying to do something big and, and crazy and fun with the, with the girls. Um, but uh, also things like last night, we watched House of the Dragon together. We're all just sitting on the couch, hanging out. And my girls are so into Lord of the Rings and House of the Dragon, all these sort of like medieval type of things. Um, and so just being with them and just sitting quietly while everyone is enjoying what's going on. Like, so, so it's both sides of the spectrum. Um, but, but it's, it's so hard to like, of all the experiences you've had throughout a lifetime, try to like say, like, this is my highlight uh, of, of parenting. It's just, it's not, it's just the moments with the, your kids where everyone is engaged and everyone is locked in and everybody is enjoying the moment. Like those, those, that's just, it doesn't get much better than that. Totally agree. That, that was a bad way to, to ask the question, uh, definitely. And, and, you know, I think it's just the presence, you know, being in each other's presence and both being present while you in each other's presence is, is a big one. And, I mean, I can just thinking now what you said, like, uh, you know, going to those matches and sitting in the box or uh, like I can relate that to with my dad, you know, going to watch rugby and uh, mm -hmm. his company would, you know, they had their own box and, and we would go there and it was like such a treat. And I, like, I'll never forget those, those moments. Uh, but I'll also never forget the other times where we just sat and watched the movie, you know, and like, and you're like, wow, that was so cool. And like, every time I hear a song, a certain song, I'm like, yeah, that was when I watched that movie with you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like last yeah, night, yeah. like who knows, whatever, maybe music was in the background when the, when the girls hear it, they're like, yeah, that was with dad. That was cool. You know what I mean? So yeah, but um, so the, the, so many cool special moments with our kids that um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just take with us. So you now, you now have your own podcast aiming up and mm -hmm. I'm kind of like wondering, like how did it all come about for you? Because you obviously work full time as well. What was your inspiration behind it? I've always wanted to do it. It's one of those things where I've been a podcast consumer for so many years. And I used to watch people that had podcasts and I'd be like, how lucky are they? They get to do that for a living. They get to talk to interesting people. I would love to do that. And I thought I would be good at it too, or at least okay at it, mildly okay. Um, and so when I did the transformation starting in December and I started focusing on my health, I think a lot of uh, mental attention went into ways in which I would like to become better. Like, if you know, my handle on Twitter, it's B gets better. Like, like I'm trying to improve. I want to make my life better. And one of the things that I sought out intentionally was like, I want to do something for me. Uh, as the avoidance, uh, I'm, I'm busy doing stuff for everyone all the time. I take zero time for myself, right? Uh, and so, so this is something that's just about me. Um, I really wanted to focus on this and I really wanted to try to uh, not just improve myself, but improve the world by having these conversations. I, th I think that, that there is a uh, networking effect that happens when you're on the internet. There's, there's economies of scale you can't even fathom. Just by having these types of conversations, Potentially millions of people can see these things. And if they get a nugget, if they get something that they can take away, um, I think that I've done my job. Like, like, wow, we've had a very engaged conversation. We've talked about topics that maybe, you know, I learned something from you, you learned something from me, and the audience can learn from both of us, right? And so I think it's a good thing, too. Not only is it is it's gratifying, it's something that I really enjoy doing, but I think it's a, a really, I don't mean to be hyperbolic, it's actually changing the world for the better. Um, and I think the last component of it is just the fact that I would love to leave a legacy for my girls. Sometimes they don't always listen to you. They don't want to hear what you have to say all the time. Uh, but, you know, if I die tomorrow or whatever, like I'm thinking like everything that's in my head, it's, it's not recorded anywhere. It's not, it's nowhere that they can actually access. And so I was sort of looking at it like an investment in the future that way too, where like I can just put all my thoughts out and everyone can listen to everything I have to say. And if I die, it's, I mean, at some point I'm going to, uh, at least, you know, my kids, my grandkids, whoever can actually look back and, and, and sort of see, you know, the, the inner texture of my mind and some of the thoughts that I've had and, and the way I conceptualize the world and maybe learn some things about me that they don't even know. So that's, that's kind of like the, the A to Z of it. How did you educate yourself? That's a tough one. Um, I'm just, I have ADD, like crazy. Like I'm interested and I've always been interested in everything. Right. So it's a double edged sword. It's a blessing and a curse. Like I'm an autodidact. I've always been the kid that would just go to the library and I would just pick out a stack of books and things I'm interested in. And then the internet happened. 
And then it was like on steroids. And so, so I was able to learn all these different things. Um, and and I, I just sort of piece things together over time. And like I said, I'm almost 50. So I have a lot of years behind me of just various topics I'm interested in. And for some reason, that stuff just gets stuck in the brain. The stuff that's really important, that's gone. Like that, that's, that, that exits my brain like two seconds later, stuff that's really important. But uh, uh, these random bits of knowledge, they just kind of get stuck up there. Yeah, look, I mean, you come across as an extremely bright guy, very articulate and almost like, well, I think it's called a, a polyglot where you can, you know, you, you, you can speak wisely on a lot of subjects. And uh, that's really cool. What was your like initial interest when you sort of were going to the library as a, as a youngster? There, there was no initial interest. Uh, it actually came from being poor. So I went to a private school, private Catholic school, shocker. Um, and uh, because my mom couldn't afford the tuition, I had to stay after school and empty waste baskets and clean blackboards and all that sort of thing. And my, my mom wouldn't finish working until late. And so I would just kind of go to the library and I would just pick out stuff. It didn't matter. It was like, cryptozoology be bigfoot and the loch ness monster paranormal stuff it would be i remember uh when i was like in sixth grade getting books on uh, particle colliders and like it didn't matter like i would just find some random books i'd start thumbing through the the, the catalog you know back in the day when actually real books were on the shelf and you could see the the jacket i would just start pulling stuff out uh it it, it there was no rhyme or reason to it my brain is incredibly chaotic like it, it just it pivots on a dime i'm interested in six million things at once um, and I start on the surface and then something will catch my interest and I'll do like a, a deep dive. This is very ADD behavior where I'll, I'll just hyper focus on one topic and I'll go as deep as I can go for like two, three weeks, learn as much as I can. Then I get bored and then I switch and I do that with something else. And eventually after, you know, rinsing and repeating, you know, a thousand times, you actually get some semblance of depth of knowledge in, in some areas. So um, I, I don't know what's driving me forward. It's like it, certain things just catch my interest and they don't seem to be connected in any way. It's just across the board and random. And I don't know how my brain works, but that's how it works. And that's cool. And ADHD is like a very interesting one. It's become very um, known to me where, where before it wasn't that actually a lot of people uh, struggle, maybe struggle is not the right word, but have ADHD. It depends on how you use it, I guess. Um, what's been your experience with it? And, and have you got like maybe any advice for some guys that, that do have ADHD? Oh boy, that, that's a tough one. Uh, I got some opinions on that that are maybe somewhat unconventional. I think ADHD is a real thing. I think it's probably overdiagnosed and I'm not even sure that I have it. Um, I, I, I use that as shorthand. I, I went into this at depth with my therapist in Washington and uh, there are a lot of uh symptoms of childhood trauma that manifest in ADHD like symptoms. Uh, I think I mentioned before with the, the childhood abuse, the, the prefrontal cortex not being fully developed or being underdeveloped is, is uh, one of those things that mimics ADHD because your prefrontal cortex is your like breaks, right? So you have impulses that arise in your brain. And that's like the thinking, the arresting portion of your brain that stops your impulses that has to do with impulse control, which is a big symptom of ADHD. Um, and so he's he's like, look, you may have it, you may not, but it's it's probably more often or more likely than not that it's related to to childhood trauma. So um, I don't know if I've got a lot of great advice for people other than uh, maybe avoid medications. Like I did the medication thing as an adult. I wasn't medicated as a kid. I was just sort of like I had weird re report cards that were like A F A F A F, depending on whether I was interested in the subject or not. Um, but I developed sort of coping mechanisms. Uh, I think not having medication allows you to like, okay, I've got this problem. I have to sort of figure out a solution to it. Um, I think medication removes that a little bit. Um, and also I think medication is not a panacea. It's got side effects and it loses effectiveness over time and it causes a bunch of issues. Um, and so, so uh, please, everyone take this with a grain of salt. I'm not claiming to be an ADD expert. Uh, but, but my uh, experience is that I did better when I was not medicated and I was forced to come up with uh, coping mechanisms on my own to sort of mitigate some of that. But I, I guess one more thing I will say, don't look at it as a handicap or a negative because I believe that it has a ton of upside. People that identify as having ADHD, whether they're diagnosed or self-diagnosed, um, I've talked to a lot of them and I see they're oftentimes very smart people. Uh, you know, have a lot of positives and a lot of upsides, but people try to put them into a box and like, okay, well, let's say, for example, you put them in a structured role where, where, where having some sort of 
really high level organizational skills is really paramount. Like putting them in that type of situation is going to be, um, you know, detrimental, right? But if you put them into a more of like a CEO type of role or like a visionary role where you don't have to be so structured, where we're coming up with new ideas and, and sort of connecting dots that other people don't see um, and, and thinking of new ideas, like, like that is something that sets people up for success if they have ADHD. Um, uh, so I think a lot of it is just choosing the right path and, and making sure that you're uh, in a function that aligns with your strengths, because it, it can be, be very hard on your ego and your, your self-esteem. If you're ADHD trying to fit into a quote unquote normie world, right? Or normie role, because uh, you can you can fail and, and you can get a lot of negative stuff attached to it that, that sort of reinforces that like I'm broken and there's something wrong with me. Um, and so I would just say to people like, like, don't, don't view yourself as broken. Think about the the upsides and lean into those. Cause those can actually be pretty powerful. There's a really cool guy on Twitter, Noah Ryan, and uh, he writes about ADHD quite a bit. And he said exactly what you said there. Like you, you, you need to see this as like a almost superpower mm -hmm. and use it to your advantage. You know, notice where like you have shortcomings. And those things you kind of like, you, you don't ignore, but you just kind of, you, you're aware of them, but then use it like to your advantage, you know, because you, you, you're going to have way better sort of um, skills in certain things than, than, than other people. And that's where you, that's where you must, you must spend your focus. So uh, I really like what you said there. What are you most excited about that you have coming up? Oh, what am I most excited about? I think it's growing the podcast, frankly. Uh, I, I think that uh, I'm just now getting rolling. It's very hard to start, as you know. There, there's so much work. You don't realize how much work has to go into this when, when you get going. And I think I've learned a lot along the way, and I've got some great guests lined up. And, and you know the way it is, you start with some uh, maybe some lower follower count people, and you kind of have to work your way up. You know, People aren't going to give you any sort of engagement if they've got 2 million followers and you've got 200. Like That's not, that's not going to work. Um, but it's not about like output metrics for me. I'm not concerned about like the number of views or anything like that, but I'm interested in, in access to uh, brilliant people, right? Like, so, so I'm excited about having conversations with people uh, who are experts in the fields I'm interested in. For example, I'm, I'm reaching out to somebody at Vanderbilt University here uh, who has done 15 years of study on gravitational waves uh, using radio telescopes and, and using uh, pulsars uh, as a, a sort of like clock mechanism to to identify gravity waves. Uh, so so things like that, like uh, getting into um, some more topics I'm interested in with people who are genuinely uh, really, really well versed in these topics and asking intelligent questions. Like I'm really excited about that. So so I, I don't want to mean like growing the podcast, getting subscriber count like that. I don't care about that. I, I want to have these conversations that are stimulating for me and can maybe, you know, uh, be beneficial for the rest of the world. Like that, that really gets me super excited. I really think like hosting a podcast is probably one of the greatest ways to grow as a person, uh, mm. to develop as a person, to become aware of so many different things that are out there, people's worldviews, et cetera, et cetera. And like literally, yeah, man. I mean, it's just it, 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 like Joe Rogan. He just encourages almost everyone to do it, you know. And he and he also encourages people to have long form conversations because these days people don't seem to have long form conversations, and that's how you learn, you know. Like sit down one on one with somebody and ask them ten questions and listen. And I think that's a that's a skill that we all need to sort of be better at. So my last question is: um, What does being ridiculously human mean to you? I think being authentic. Right. So that's what I think about when you say ridiculously human, because we, the, the con concept of ridiculous um, is like worthy of ridicule. And I think people avoid ridicule. They're scared of it. They're afraid to be actually human. And I'm, I consider myself like patient zero for that. Right. Like I'm, I've always had been very protective and please don't criticize me and trying to have this shield up. And so it's, it's about intentionally becoming vulnerable lowering the shields, allowing yourself to be, you know, you don't have to be perfect. Like you said, you don't have to be right all the time. You don't have to be protective. It's like, look, I love, I, I say this all the time. Rick Rubin has one of the best lines ever when he talks about it in the creative sense is like, what I'm saying right now is a diary entry. 
that's all it is, right? Like, I don't have, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but this is my perspective. This is my view and right or wrong, I'm laying it all out of the line, right? And sometimes I'm going to be ridiculously wrong. And it's like, and being okay with that, I think is really important. And that's something I'm aiming for. And I struggle with uh, a lot. And that's one of the reasons I really love your podcast um, is that there's a lot of people on here uh, that, that are just being completely vulnerable, transparent, open, and just letting the chips fall where they may. And I'm really trying to take a, a, a page from that book. Well, but I think you've taken a, a huge page from that book. I mean, just listening to you speak today, like, but you, you are as vulnerable as they come. And uh, you, you, you know, you just, you're, you're just such a, I, I just really like you as a bloke, right? And I think like just hearing your story and, and what you went through, like, I'm like, man, I just want to, I just want to give you a big hug, but, and it's a big <laughs> hug to say like, everything's going to be okay. But also you're doing a flipping awesome do- job, but I mean, you know, for the, from what you went through to what you're doing now, like uh, the success you've achieved, uh, the good vibes that you spread, the great conversations that you're having and the deepness that you go, like you definitely are like leaving the world in a better place. And I'm just grateful that we sort of stumbled across each other on, on Twitter and uh, to have hosted you today, but so keep, keep doing what you're doing, man. I think, uh, yeah, you, your podcast is going to grow massively and you've got great guests on there and you're having awesome conversations. So all the best with everything. And, um, thanks for your time today, bud. Uh, thank you, Gareth. I'm honored. I, I really am happy we met as well. You're one of my favorite people on Twitter, a hundred percent, not just saying that cause I'm on your podcast now. <laughs> thanks a lot, buddy.